Ian Bremmer, Wall Street hates uncertainty. And in your new book, Superpower, you say that Barack Obama has the world thoroughly confused. So how unnerved should both Wall Street and the world be by this? Uh, the world should be much more unnerved than Wall Street. Uh, you certainly know that uh, in a world that's much more geopolitically uncertain with a lot more violence, uh, the United States looks like a safe haven. Our borders are Mexico, Canada, and two big bodies of water. Uh, so the dollar's doing well, uh, the markets are at record highs, and, you know, unemployment is coming down. I mean, all that stuff we know. But internationally, America's allies and everyone I talk to, foreign ministers and heads of state, and you name it, they're, they're saying, what, what do you stand for? And are you committed to us? And we should be hedging. And we see that all over the world with the Gulf allies not coming to Washington when Obama invites them, with Netanyahu coming to Washington when Obama says don't come, when the Brits say they're going to join this China-led bank after the Americans tell them not to. I mean, on all of these issues, we have countries that we've thought historically were really aligned with us that are actually orienting in ways that long term are really going to fragment the global system. And that's something that's clearly going to have a big impact on global economies. Well, speaking of hedging, let's go around the world. Is hedge fund managers, if you will, would you go long or short our relationship with Russia after all these resets? Um, I would certainly go short. Uh, Putin is the single most powerful human being in the world. And we have said that we're going to punish not his country, but him, if he doesn't behave the way we want him to. Well, he's not going to change. He's not about to pull out of Ukraine. Uh, and so as a consequence, we're seeing escalation. We're seeing Russia move as far as they can towards China, which is not going to be punished for uh, allowing them to do that. And we see the Russians, meanwhile, uh, really flexing their muscles militarily, especially around Europe. We also see them engaging in more serious cyber attacks against the United States, our infrastructure, our president's emails. Uh, this clearly can get worse. We underestimate the Russians seriously in the short term and their ability to cause damage. What about long, short, our relationship with China? China is trying to assert itself in the Pacific, but that can uh, run into problems with our ally, Japan. Uh, the China relationship has been managed much better than the Russia relationship, there's no question. In part, that's because Xi Jinping feels pretty confident right now. Um, you know, oil prices are low, he benefits from that. Uh, China's growth is slowing, but in large part, that's because of the economic transformation they've engaged in. And the Chinese are trying to challenge the U.S.-led economic system while doing much less militarily. So far, that's playing pretty well for them. They've got a Marshall Plan. They're basically spending over a trillion dollars on infrastructure and equity investments in countries around their region and emerging markets around the world to get those countries more aligned with China. In the near term, we're going to let them do it. We don't have a response. In the long term, I say we underestimate Russia near term, we underestimate China long term. As they become the world's largest economy, you're going to see so many countries that used to be economically aligned to the U.S., our internet, our standards, our companies, that are suddenly going to be balancing with orienting towards Chinese standards, Chinese state-owned enterprises. And that's probably the single thing that should most unnerve CEOs of our own corporations, because they're going to see a lot of countries as more strategically problematic. Here's a short-term trade for you. Would you go long or short our relationship with Iran? Oh, I'd go long. Uh, I think that uh, you are going to see a nuclear deal between the Americans and the Iranians that will be supported by the permanent five members of the United Nations plus Germany. And even though Congress doesn't like it, they're not going to go against uh, the international community. The Israelis don't like it, but they're not going to bomb. The Saudis don't like it, but there's nothing they can do about it. So ultimately, the Iranians are a larger market. They're more diversified. Women play a bigger role. They've got a big diaspora in countries like the U.S. People are going to start investing there. The question will be, are the Americans the last to get in? Because if you sign a deal, but it's not a strong deal, Congress might say, we're not going to take sanctions off while the Europeans and everyone else is doing business. So you could have a better diplomatic relationship while the American companies are left on the sidelines. Well, President Obama is not going to be the portfolio manager for these positions much longer. We have a whole slew of candidates uh, who are on the campaign trail. Can you just talk about which uh, current candidate you think would manage this portfolio of relationships best? You know, it's very early to say that. I guess there are a couple of things I would say. Um, there's no question that Hillary Clinton, with her experience as Secretary of State, 
has more capabilities, more background on foreign policy than all the other candidates put together. You have to admit that. And when she was Secretary of State, she had a pretty coherent strategy. Didn't all work, what I would call Moneyball America, where she's not focused on human rights, she's not focused on making the world safe for democracy. She's really saying, let's, let's put our investments in the place that we think are gonna make a difference. So it was a pivot to Asia, it was a trans-Pacific partnership, it was don't do Israel-Palestine because they don't care and it's too much focus. To, you know, try to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. And even on things like Libya and Syria, you know, it wasn't a super aggressive policy. It was, you know, absolutely take a whack, but limit the amount that the Americans are gonna get engaged. The interesting thing about Hillary is as candidate, she's backed away from every single one of those things. So, you know, are we now seeing an inauthentic Hillary when she becomes president? If she becomes president, would she govern like she did as Secretary of State? Or is it a very different ballgame? So there's risk around it, but she has the background. On the Republican side, the, probably the most coherent candidate on foreign policy so far would be between Rand Paul, who really wants the United States to just get away from all this stuff, stop their surveillance. Iraq, he doesn't have a problem answering on Iraq. He says, basically, we'd be better off if Saddam Hussein was still there. A trillion dollars later, and how many American you know, boys and girls dead? Uh, you know, I, a lot of people understand that. Don't do Libya. And then Marco Rubio on the other side of the spectrum, uh, quite coherent at the Council on Foreign Relations two weeks ago, saying the exact opposite. We want an indispensable America. We want an America that actually stands for democracy and human rights globally, and that is going to defend any international incursion on airspace or outer space or sea space. I mean, th you know, th that sounds very muscular. So what's interesting is we really do have a debate in 2016 in a way that we didn't and should have in 2012. I think that's why this book is important. Well, thank you for coming to our space. Thanks a lot, Ian. My pleasure. And thank you for watching The Street.